Okay, hello. I'm President Ed Sanders, President and Co-Founder of 50 Hoops. I want to welcome you to our Mobile Cancer Conferences and Workshops, better known as McCall. We want to first thank all of our sponsors, uh, Genentech, Takeda, Amgen, Janssen, Bristol Myers Squibb, and Isoray for their contributions to make this historic online workshop called African Americans in Clinical Trials Act 1 and 2. And you're going to be mostly muted, muted a lot, unless the host facilitator unmutes you. I type your questions in the chat, and the facilitator will identify you and answer your questions. Or you can raise your hand live or hand using the more pull down menu. As you, most of you know, Pat and myself are both preacher's kids. So we believe that God is always in the beginning and the end. So let's start out with our invocation. To do our invocation today will be Senior Pastor Dr. Jacqueline Thompson, Allen Temple Baptist Church, Oakland, California. Dr. Thompson. Good morning, Ed and Pat. Thank you so much for having me with you today. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for another day of life. We recognize during these pandemic times how precious life is. So we are thankful for the opportunity, despite all of the chaos, to be able to gather in this moment. God, I thank you for Ed and Pat Sanders for their dedication, for their diligence, Lord, for their hard work. I thank you for technology, for the ability to be able to gather and still do this very important work for everyone that is on the call, that is sharing, that is participating. Bless our time together, make it fruitful, increase our understanding, but most of all, let us do something that will strengthen and impact the lives of those who are least and lost and left out, those who are suffering, those who are struggling, those who are looking for connection in this hour. We thank you for it now, and we believe it's done. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so thank much, you. Dr. Thompson. You're welcome. Now, the theme for September series is African Americans in Clinical Trials. It's called Solutions That Stick. It's going to be presented in two acts. I'll tell you a little bit more about it later on. First, I want to introduce a few people. Dr. Robin Kelly, co-host and also Senior Technical Consultant for 50 Hoops. Raise your hand, Robin. <laughs> also our medical advisor, Dr. Jason Porter, uh, hematologist and oncologist from the West Cancer Center in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. Porter, are you there? No, he had to, okay. he had a meeting. And also our co-host and facilitator, we couldn't do it without her, uh, past president of the National Medical Association, uh, she's president and CEO of Brown and Associates, Dr. Doris Brown. Give her a Yay! Give her a welcome. <laughs> now, we okay. want to remind you again to complete all the poll questions and surveys. Now I'm going to turn this over to my wife, Pat. Hello, everybody. Uh, again, thank you for joining for this second part of the Mobile Cancer Conferences and Workshops, McCall, for our September 24th and 25th. This is our fifth and sixth workshops for the year. And thank you all for your continued support of 50 Hoops Outreach to educate African Americans and underserved about diseases and the clinical trials that affect them. Robin, uh, we'll put the rules in the chat as we go along. She will also be sending out polls. Um, we plan these gatherings generally around the lunch hour, so we hope you'll feel free to have your lunch where, wherever you are and listen to our speakers. Now understand this is not a webinar. It's a workshop. It's a gathering together of friends and family, medical partners, sponsors, to speak about diseases that affect us. We're joining African-American patients, churches, medical and academic partners across the country to improve our education and improve the quality of our life. Some may call it organized chaos. We call it fun and educational. Now the McCall workshops move fast. We don't string things along. The presentations are brief, and all of you who are joining our center stage. For September, we'll listen to our speakers 
and you about your ideas about solutions that stick when we're trying to recruit African Americans into clinical trials so we can get our DNA into these drugs that can save our lives. Now, first, I want everyone to turn on your chat. You can feel free to comment, ask questions. And for those of you who are joining by cell phone, go to the three dots that are at the bottom of your screen that says more and pull down the menu and it says chat and you can open that. Now, use chat to ask questions and remember you can type your questions into chat, but we also will have live questions. Just raise your hand and Dr. Brown will call on you and unmute you. Now, here's the catch. You've got about 10 to 20 seconds to ask a question. So please be brief, stay on topic, and please try to avoid long preliminary comments because we want to end this and, and make sure if there's anything you wanna comment, put it in the chat. You'll be muted most of the time, stay muted unless you're called upon. We want to try to avoid the background noises in your space that could be interfering with others listening. Gifts and prizes. This includes bags of 50 hoops, souvenir gifts, event t-shirts, novelties printed, which we will mail to you. This is part of our, 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 our extras. We also have $50 Visa gift cards that are sponsored by Visa for those who are selected. These are given away alternately by Dr. Brown at the close of the workshop. Now, if you get a gift bag or a card, just email psoc at yahoo.com. Robin, could you put that in? That's P-E-A-S-O-C at yahoo.com. I'm typing it now. And mail and send Add your mailing address, zip code, and wherever you want to receive your gift or gift card. Finally, you need to be connected as you are with your name visible for the drawing at the end. Now, we want to remind you to complete all the polls. Uh, Robin, you have the timing of the polls and the surveys to qualify. Now, you should already have your first poll getting ready to start now. Are we about ready for the first poll, Robin? Okay. We are. Okay, good. Now, our NMA co-host for the series is our dear friend, Dr. Doris Brown, as Ed said, president, CEO of Brown and Associates. What are you, the 18th president of the- 118th. <laughs> Ooh. We're 125 years old. Oh my goodness, 118th president. So Doris, take it away. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. And I know it seems like I'm seeing, I'm not getting the chat box, but I'll get off in a minute and then come back on. But I wanna, again, extend my welcome to everyone for this fifth, sixth installment of the Mobile Cancer Conferences and Workshops. As uh, you heard Ed say, this is called Macaw. This is African American Health Matters and it's going to be presented in two acts. Um, today, we're going to hear from the stakeholders around the country, and we're going to talk with them very briefly, things that we want you to know and how it's been implemented in the community, in the churches, in the universities, medical centers, uh, and all of the constituents that's there. We're looking for solutions on how to get us more engaged in clinical research, and that's very important. We also want you to know that you have to stick to your time. This is a one, two, three. I have been called a, a chop chop and a sergeant and all of those things coming from a military background. So um, I, I promise that I'll try to cut you off, but we really want to hear what you have to say. So keep it quick to the point. And this also applies to when we get to the Q&A period, we don't want a whole speech, we want your question. So jot it down so that you can make it succinct. Now, let me introduce to you our first Act One panel. Uh, Dr. Kevin Sneed, raise your hand. Okay, he's from the University of South Florida Health Center. Uh, Ms. Cassandra Harris from MD Anderson. Um, Dr. Thomas Britt. 
from the Chicago State University, Dr. Maisha Standerfoot from Morehouse College. I am here. I apologize. I'm having some technical difficulties, but I am here. Okay, <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Okay. okay, Dr. Robinski, screen. I think I let you in, so I know you're there. <laughs> I'm here. Hi okay. there. Sorry. Great. She's a from a private surgical practice. And Miss Danita Brown from Brown Missionary Baptist uh, Church. Before we okay. officially go ahead, Doris, just want to let everyone know that this is a chance for you all to introduce yourselves. So the poll is about to close. So just take a second to finish the poll and we'll be on our okay. way. Okay. Okay. Because we're we almost home. ready to run that second poll. Okay, now Thank we're going you. to, the poll is in Almost and over, done. so okay, let's start then, um, oh goodness, I'm getting a mix up, Dr. here we go, okay, Act 1, Scene 1, in August, the clinical researchers and the 50 Hoops National Network of Coordinators were matched, and they were tasked with making contact in order to begin a strategic planning process of introducing clinical studies and researchers to their constituencies. They were also asked to develop a tentative plan as to how they will utilize the resources from each other to educate their audiences. So now we're gonna hear about these matchmaking reports and we want the audience to join in the discussion. So, okay. Hold on. Hold on. We've got to hear, we want, to, we want to do the panel of solutions that work. Dr. Sneed, Cassandra, and the first. We want to do that first. Okay. okay. Yeah. So Dr. Sneed is on first. Well, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Again, I'm Dr. Sneed. I'm the Dean of the uh, Tunisia College of Pharmacy at the University of South Florida with USFL. And I would just like to very briefly um, uh, just kind of state part of our journey with 50 Hoops and exactly how we've made uh, enormous progress getting into the community here in Tampa, Florida. Uh, back in 2007 and 2008, well, we received a grant from the NIH uh, to start what we called at the time the Center for Equal Health. It was a collaboration between the Moffitt Cancer Center and USF Health here where I am. Um, when that grant came to an end in 2012, uh, I quickly transitioned a portion of my, uh, my portion of that grant into what is now called We Care. And We Care is the work group enhancing community advocacy and research engagement. And so the whole idea from, my, uh, from the grant all the way through We Care has been to make sure that we were doing everything we could to build a connection into the community so that we could increase minority participation or underrepresented participation in clinical research. Initially, it all started out with men and prostate cancer. Now we accept everything from clinical trials and clinical research all the way into behavioral research. One of the key things that we were able to do, number one, and the most important thing I believe we did from the very beginning, was to reach into the community and build what we called at the time our Community Research Review Committee, the CRRC. And that uh, we had people, lay people from the community that we brought in, we formed a committee, and then we actually taught them all the, uh, the rudiments of research. We actually had uh, various modules that we created for them. And so that they really began to understand exactly what research was all about. What does it mean to submit a grant? What is the IRB? And what does it mean when you get a large grant of $6 million and why can't we turn around and, and put all of that money back into the community? Uh, very quickly after that, and probably now what has turned out to be the most pivotal thing that we've accomplished, we worked with, uh, we built a community relationship authentically with a uh, community group called Reach Up. And so now collectively, the University of South Florida and Reach Up, we go out into the community. And uh, during the COVID pandemic, because we started so many years ago, we have now had uh, probably seven, if not eight webinars. I just finished another one yesterday where we are now going out and educating the public about the importance of clinical research, the importance of, of participating. But more importantly, individuals out in the community are now going and advocating for us and bringing me to even larger groups so that we can bring them in and we can authentically build trust and talk about clinical research. And so without building that, that, that connection to the community, very often it won't work. 
And so in the final 30 seconds I have, I would like to just share with you a quick story about some of the COVID trials. Here in Florida, one of the companies building a vaccine went into a large metropolitan area, assuming that many of the underrepresented and, and ethnic groups and, and racial groups would automatically come and enroll, but they didn't. They hadn't built the groundwork to actually go in and then build trust for people to, to know who they were. Here recently, we have built uh, a relationship with a company and now we actually have people from our African American and our Latino communities asking and calling, can they participate? A much different outcome, but it's been done with trust. And I wanna thank 50 Hoops for all of the support and the partnership they gave us from day one, way back in 2008 and here we are in 2020. And so I just wanna thank you all and I'm gonna stop right there and I'll be available for any questions that you all may have. One more thing. Back in 2008, we hired a really enterprising uh, postdoctoral and graduate student at the time, Maisha Standifer, and she's now here today as a professor at Morehouse <laughs> College of Medicine. And so I couldn't be prouder because I think it really does speak to exactly what happens when we start that process and we grow from within. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's why I'm so going to let you go over a little bit longer because we wanted to hear about your medical, your student that uh, is now part of the whole program. Thank you so much. Now we'll hear from Ms. Cassandra Harris from MD Anderson. Hello, everyone. I am Cassandra Harris from MD Anderson, but I'm also the chair of the National Black Leadership Initiative on Cancer. And I think that's what I'm talking about in this portion. The National okay. Black Leadership Initiative on Cancer was started by Dr. Lovell Jones. Some of you may already know him. He was at MD Anderson for a very long time. And our mission is to impact cancer health disparities through collaborative efforts at the community and organizational levels to address cancer awareness, cancer prevention, and cancer research in the African American community. Because we don't have a lot of time, I'll just kind of highlight some of the things that we've done in Houston. But I also want to include that our coalition includes people from academia, hospitals, retired nurses, clergy, mega churches, social workers, community health workers, and survivors. We work together to address awareness in our community during various months throughout the year. We particularly focus on Clinical Trials Awareness Month, and that is in May. And we always uh, have a program in collaboration with some other institution in our community. This October, we're partnering with Baylor College of Medicine to pilot their new breast cancer monologue. We are going to view it. We're inviting other people in our community to view it, to give them feedback before they offer this particular program to the community. In the area of research, we are proud of our relationship that we have with the late Dr. Selena Smith. Some of you may already know her as well. And she had a program called EPICS, and it was an education program to increase colorectal cancer screening. We work with her to find and train community health workers in our community to go out and talk with individuals about in groups about increasing colorectal cancer screening in the Houston area because we were one of the areas that had low screening rates in, uh, in, in across the U.S. And one of the other things that we are very proud of is our health ministry events. A lot of times we go to conferences and we hear about things that we're doing as professionals, but this particular conference highlighted what the community was doing in, in relation to cancer prevention, cancer awareness, and their research participation. And we brought together researchers and community leaders for these events and our third event was um, had to be rescheduled because of COVID, but we are working on that right now. So I just wanted to highlight those things for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Of course, uh, I know Lovell Jones and the programs that uh, Lovell and Armin had uh, from Baylor and, and MD Anderson for a long, long period of time. And so welcome. Um, next, we'll hear from um, Dr. Britt. Thomas Britt. And for some reason, I am frozen. Dr. Thomas Britt, you're oh, on? Yes. Yeah. He's, yes, and he's speaking, but I don't hear him. Yeah, I'm waiting for you to give me a chance. Hi, this okay. is Dr. Britt. I'm on mute. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, we can. You unmuted, it. yes. Chicago, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I, I'm a, this, is a, this is a nice entree. Uh, Dr. Harris mentioned the National Black Leadership Initiative on Cancer. I've been a part of the National Black Leadership Initiative on Cancer for, I don't know, maybe 25 years or so. I'm actually the coalition chair for Chicago. And uh, I work with Dr. Selena Smith. I work with Dr. Uh, Leon Sullivan. Actually, I gave the uh, summer report back in 2002, I believe. So I've been around, been around the corner a couple of times. But anyway, uh, Dr. Selena Smith approached me several years ago, probably 2011, 2012. We wanted to do the EPICS program, educational program to increase colorectal cancer screening. And so why did we pursue it? Well, we found that the incidence uh, was 20% higher. The incidence of colorectal cancer was by 20% higher in white, in uh, 20% higher in blacks than in whites. The mortality rate is about 45% higher in blacks than in whites. And in the state of Illinois, we ranked about 36 in the prevalence. So we decided that we would go ahead and do it. Um, the program national outcome, we had nationally about 4,000 people. Uh, our post-education screening rate was 40%. If we look at the name, education program, does education increase screening? And so what we found was our post-education screening nationally was about 20%. Locally, we had a much smaller number, uh, and also smaller number was about two, 210. Uh, the post-education screening was 40%. But when I looked at our own site and some of our sites that we actually did the uh, screening, uh, we had a 78% class completion rate. We had a 70, 76% uh, fecal occult blood test rate. And uh, that rate was about 25% higher than the uh, overall adherence in larger studies. So we attributed our outcome to the course presentation in a known, trusted, accessible location, uh, a known presenter, uh, uh, and also we gave incentives for people to uh, complete the uh, study. Thank you. Now, I, I have another grant, but we'll, we'll just stop there if that's what you want me to do. I had another grant called Chicago Southside Cancer Disparities Initiative. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, this one is a bit longer, uh, but what I will do is just tell you one of the outcomes we had. That'll be good. Um, it's called Chicago Southside Cancer Disparities Initiative. Uh, we had at least four town hall meetings. Well, let me, let me start over. Let me do this a better way. Our aim, we had two aims, to create an inter-university collaboration to develop, implement, and evaluate cancer disparities curriculum to be integrated within Chicago State and also at the University of Chicago. Aim number two was to provide opportunities for community involvement through collaboratively developing and enhancing existing service learning classes at both institutions. Uh, the outcomes that we had, we had presentations at four town halls. We had nine mentorship programs. We had at least eight uh, mini lectures. Uh, we had site visits. We actually visited uh, FSU down in Tampa uh, when Adi, I think Trotman was there. Uh, we had four radio shows, uh, community and academic health fairs. We had at least 30. Uh, scholarship presentations, we had about 29. And some of the agencies that we submitted our manuscript and, and uh, abstracts to was the APHA, the American uh, Academy of Nurse, Nurses, the Association of American Medical Colleges, the Journal of Racial and Ethnic Health Disparities, the American Association of Cancer Research, and the Royal Society of Public Health. Wow. So, so we, we got busy and we involved our students, we involved faculty members from different areas within our college. We had the nurses, we had the uh, health administration people, and we had occupational therapy, as well as the students in our undergraduate program, as well as our MPH program. Okay. So I, I'm gonna stop there. Okay, just in time for another poll. So let's take another poll. Okay. We can continue on uh, while, while the, uh, we introduce uh, Dr. Standiford. Uh, Dr. Brown, are you still there? Dr. Standiford? My I think that the round had uh, come out for a minute. I think she may be okay. back in. 
Okay. Yes, I'm here. Hello, okay. everyone. Hi. Hi. Again, I apologize for the technical difficulties, but uh, thank you so much for the illustrious uh, introduction, Dr. Sneed. Uh, working with you is a, a reward and definitely a benefit in terms of my career in uh, education for uh, uh, vulnerable communities, medically vulnerable communities uh, with clinical trials. Can you hear me? Yeah giving a little feedback okay let me turn it down yeah so again i wanted to thank you pat and ed for inviting me to be a, a, a participant with the workshops over this past summer and so uh, at the current moment i am health policy director at the satcher health leadership institute at morehouse school of medicine in atlanta georgia and as uh, i got my start i guess my beginning uh, as Dr. Snead talked about in 2009, when we were awarded the NIH transdisciplinary grant to focus on cancer health disparities with uh, Dr. Snead, USF colleagues, and Moffitt Cancer Center colleagues. Uh, I then went on as a graduate student to work as a postdoc uh, a disparities fellow, and then went on to the VA, where I concentrated on health equity. Uh, and uh, attempted to focus on some of the cancer disparities or uh, disparities focusing on some of the populations within the mental health area and all, also with women uh, and the delivery of care within the VA. And then subsequently, as I mentioned, uh, I have now transitioned recently over to Morehouse School of Medicine. So I'm so excited to be a part of We Care, as Dr. Sneed uh, provided the synopsis of what is occurring in Tampa Bay and Actually, it's, uh, I guess, in terms of broadening its scope re beyond Tampa, but also throughout the state and the region. And we are also looking at collaborating with the Moffitt Cancer Center. I am currently working with their community of um, biology and cancer disparities with Dr. Yomoa. And you will receive more information uh, from uh, Pat and Ed that I forwarded to them this morning. And also now with the efforts focusing on COVID and the mitigation of some of the COVID and the strategies that we're focusing on with HBCU, HBCU medical schools and colleges and the efforts of increasing education on some of the COVID-19 prevention efforts along with the vaccine. So excited to be on board and we we'll welcome any questions and provide any answers I can uh, do at this moment. Thank you again. Thank you, Doctor. Thank Stein. you. Well, I'm back on. Good. I don't know. I have a lot of technical difficulties with uh, one machine not allowing me to. <laughs> it's giving me a lot of feedback, so I don't know. But uh, the next one is Dr. Robin Screen. I'll figure out what this is when you get your presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited and glad to be here. I'm a breast surgeon in the DFW area. Um, <clears throat> and for those of you who aren't sure, that's I take care of breast cancer patients as well as those at high risk for breast cancer. Um, I come to you from the community perspective. And um, <clears throat> I want to say that there is a long sorted history about clinical trials. And especially as minorities, we are fearful of them. But I think we need to use those instances to be judicious, but to still pursue clinical trials. I've had the opportunity to participate in a number of clinical trials, working with my medical and radiation oncology colleagues, as well as through the um, <clears throat> Society of Surgical Oncology and uh, several other entities. Um, and what I would share with you just briefly is actually more from a personal perspective of why it's important for African Americans to get uh, involved in clinical trials. Um, my mother-in-law had congestive heart failure, and she actually entered into a clinical trial for a medication that probably would have been pulled off the market if not for the fact that they had not had enough African Americans enrolled. As it turns out, this particular medication is efficacious only in African Americans. Um, it, it doesn't work in other populations. So it is available for us to use. Um, insurances, however, won't cover it for other ethnic groups because it doesn't work. But had my mother-in-law or had many other African Americans not participated, we wouldn't have that information. 
So I'm here just to employ you that clinical trials are important, that there are safety measures in place, but that we must also be diligent, but we must participate. And we need to ask our physician who's taking care of us, what clinical trials do you know about what's available? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sistine. Are you still indoors? I'm muted, but I, I'm unmuted, but it keeps going back. Um, it's we're something all, here in the Washington back. area that's <laughs> sort of causing problems. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can yes. hear you. Good, okay. Um, thank you so much for uh, the information on asking your doctors to really participate in clinical trials because that's a very key point. Our next uh, and final presenter in this segment is Ms. Danita Brown from the Missionary Baptist Church, Brown Missionary Baptist Church. How can I forget that? That's my name. Both <laughs> <laughs> of your names. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. Can everybody hear me? Hey, Danita. Hey, how y'all doing? Good. Jen, hey, Robin. Jenny has, uh, and I have been talking, and it's just such an honor to be a part of this team. And we've already gotten permission from Dr. Bartholomew Orr to uh, start sending out uh, information. And we have, right now, I'm putting her to work. I need 7,000 uh, postcards. So that's what we're working on. We want to send them out to the congregate, to, uh, with, to the 40 to 75 year olds. And we just want to start getting the word out. We chose not to do it during breast cancer awareness program because the men will not tune in. The black African men do not want to hear about breast cancer, even though they can get it. So we had to come up with another strategy to get the more guys involved because I too thought that only men got multi myeloma. So that's how we're going to do it. We're going to roll it out uh, probably about the last part of October, if not before, and we're going to send it out to about 7,000 members in our church. Woo! I've already gotten approval. Wonderful. Yes, <laughs> gotten approval. So now she's working with the uh, pastor or assistant to come up with uh, unique ways to get it out through the mail. But we are so excited. Uh, we're going to do it through mail. He's going to announce it from the pulpit to encourage people to get tested. And I too will be putting it out through our cancer support group. And uh, we're just excited because like I said, I had no idea that, me, uh, that women could get it. I thought it was, guys, I thought it was just a guy disease. So, <laughs> <laughs> kind of like y'all thought breast cancer was a lady female disease. So we're excited about it. And Jenny has really been, a, uh, oh, I just enjoy talking with her all the time. Thank you so much. So did Welcome. I answer all the questions, Dr. Brown? <laughs> yes. <that is. laughs> so, um, and again, yes, uh, it's important for men to know about breast cancer uh, so much so because not only 1% of the men get breast cancer, but you have to be supportive of your significant other when they develop breast cancer. So breast cancer is not just a woman's disease, it's a yeah. family disease. You got to get your children involved and your husbands and your spouses and all of that. So that is really wonderful. Um, is there another poll right now? Or it can be coming up. Okay. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So while we're waiting for this poll, let's see. I'm a we can move on to the next. Yep. Week. There the you go. Week. Okay. Oh. Launching it. Yes, and while we're, all yeah. good, we're going to talk about our matchmaking reports now. Um, and I mentioned that uh, before that uh, the network coordinators, they were matched with the clinical group. And now we're going to talk about uh, something in those matchmaking reports, and then we'll have uh, our Q&A. Um, and I know that uh, a couple of the reports came in um, because of a person's not being there. Uh, Pat, do you want to have them put up after the report? Yeah, if you can share your screen at all, I've got them all. Um, I can share some of the screens. Let me know what you need. I've got a few of them up. Okay. Um, so let me, I'm not sure if I can share while you're talking though. So see what you can do about that. Okay, as soon as the poll is down, I think we can then 
put them up. So let's go. Finish it up. Just finishing it up. We are. Okay. Okay. Last little second. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Our first matchmaking report is Dr. Irene Gobriel on multiple myeloma. Yes, thank you. And we have here with us, of course, Dr. Wingfield, and I have six of our members, including Maya, who just joined us a few weeks ago. So thank you for everyone to have us uh, aboard. And what I'll have is Jeannie. You probably already heard from Danita. We have 7,000 postcards, so thank you for that. But I'll have Jeannie maybe present quickly our updates on the PROMISE study and what she has helped us do so far. Jeannie? While she's being unmuted, uh, I'll just remind everyone we're trying to prevent myeloma by early screening and early intervention. And we really have a whole support system uh, right there with Dr. Wingfield to make sure that we have uh, care for everyone who gets diagnosed with this. We truly want to prevent myeloma. We don't want a single patient diagnosed with myeloma after we do this early screening. Um, I'm not yes. sure if Jeannie can unmute herself or if you, you need to. Me. Okay, perfect. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So um, I would just like to say how amazing it's been the last couple of weeks having these wonderful conversations with our very valuable stakeholders with such great ideas and uh, such a willingness to, to work and, and such dedication to the communities. And I just really wanted to extend my, my gratitude to everyone. It was, it's been great. And um, I, we don't have a lot of time. We have a lot to report. Um, I'm just gonna provide a brief breakdown of some of the initiatives that we've discussed. And um, we, uh, I'm happy to report that we've connected with just about all of our stakeholders, except for Rick, who I connected with uh, today, which I will follow up this afternoon. Uh, and we have sent, uh, follow-up information, we have sent materials, and we've connected with all of them. And we have some great ideas, everything going from, ranging from uh, social media to um, webinars. Dr. Hill, um, I spoke with her, inspiring. She shared many ways that we can bring awareness through education and encourage enrollment through her outreach programs. And Danita, we have to mention you again. Thank you so much. Uh, that, that We had that call right before we got on, on this call. So I'm really looking forward to connecting with Donna. That's gonna be amazing. And we're gonna continue to uh, identify ways that we can work together. And uh, uh, Deacon uh, Harold, wonderful conversation with him. Very appreciative of his insight and his advice. Mm -hmm. We discussed putting on a Zoom conference and other ways that we can work together with Allen Temple Baptist Church. And uh, Valerie, Valerie Worthy, she's a patient navigator at Duke. Great ideas. Um, for example, providing a, a page on her, uh, a, a link and a page on her website, a, a page on her website with a link to our site and uh, with information as well. So, um, and we also talked about some virtual events. Um, as you can see, I have a lot to report, so I'm trying to talk fast. Uh, Sheila, so good to see you in person. We've had some wonderful conversations, a very impactful discussion, and we identified, again, a number of ways that we can provide this much-needed education and awareness. She's got a tremendous amount of um, networks, Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship and others. She even offered to... Um, reach out to her sorority, um, Alpha Kappa Alpha. So um, that is <laughs> amazing. So really looking forward to, to working with her and, and everyone. Um, Virginia, she graciously shared her time to brainstorm ideas with us a couple of times with Virginia Bradford. We're meeting next week to begin our plans for a webinar series with Kiana Black Nurses Association and kayak and so um we're really looking forward to talking to dr gobriel who is just hearing about <laughs> some of these great initiatives because they're happening so fast we're so excited and everyone really is looking forward to getting your input um and so much <laughs> okay. okay we'll get back we'll get back with you Jeannie. We'll, it's a yeah. lot it's a lot i'm so proud of all of you I really am. <laughs> thank you <laughs> Uh, the next one is Kathy Florick, but I think she's not here. No. And sent uh, some information, and you can share the screen now, Pat. 
Okay. Uh, with which one? Which one? Crystal do we... Crystal Square. Uh, Dr. Gahan is next. I mean, uh, whoever is. Well, it was Kathy oh, the Crystal Myers Square. Okay, yeah, hang on. Myers Let's see if we got something here. Hang on. You, while we're waiting for that, if you want, we can go with Dr. Gahan. Yeah, go ahead. Prostate cancer, Dr. Gahan. Uh, I think I think Rick uh, Thornton. When we get to the when you call the networkers, I think Rick is going to be reporting for him. I think he was on, but he had to go back to surgery. Okay. Is is Dr. Uh, Ping Mu also on prostate? Yeah, here yeah. he is. Thank Why you, Dr. You? Mu, for coming back. I'm here. Hi, okay. everybody. Uh, my name is Ping, and I'm an assistant professor at UT Southwestern, working on prostate cancer. Uh, I'm different from everybody else. I'm not a physician, I'm a scientist. So me and my clinician colleague, Dr. Ganesh Raj, he has some uh, clinical duty today, so he cannot be here. We propose to uh, a new clinical trial to use a new class of drug called the GR inhibitor to targeting uh, advanced uh, metastasis prostate cancer, which we think the originally uh, widely used AR target therapy wasn't effective in many patients and the resistance developed very quickly. So we propose to use this new trial to use this new drug to treat those resistance tumors. And we think it could also be very useful to reduce the uh, outcome ratio disparity of prostate cancer. As we know that African-American are 2.3-fold uh, higher mortality to the metastasis prostate cancer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Thank you for coming back. Yes, uh, and now Dr. Pinto and lung cancer. Okay, I, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about uh, a one national clinical trial that's being run by the National Cancer Institute called the Insignia Trial. Now, the main thing about this trial is that it is running nationally. It's looking at adding immunotherapy to standard chemotherapy. And so some of the patients are gonna get the immunotherapy right away. Some are gonna get standard therapy plus the immunotherapy. And some are gonna get the immunotherapy later. So it's a three-arm trial national. It turns out that I'm at Stanford, but this trial is open all over America. And it's actually open in really every hospital in the Bay Area. So it doesn't really matter what your insurance is or what network you're in, you can access this trial. So for instance, all the cancer, all the Kaiser hospitals in the Bay Area have this open. All the Sutter hospitals network have this open. All the private hospitals have this open. And so it is generally applicable and accessible. If, if I could share my screen just for one second. Please do, yes. Okay, now let's see how I do this. Share screen, pull up. Uh, document. So here are the websites for ECOG Akron, which is the research base that's actually running the trial. Um, the clinical trial information specifically about this um, insignia trial is on this link. And we the National Cancer Institute. I think here. you have to give him permission to share the oh, screen. Oh, okay. Sorry. And you have to uh, put his name in or something so that... Okay. Well, um, <laughs> don't, don't wait. You know what? I'm going to send all the links to everybody. That's fine. So you send time. the links around. So, yeah. you know, that that's the main thing that I would say. And those websites actually have pages that talk about all the trials that are open, all the locations that are open. And it actually has really good patient information about the myths about clinical trial, the protections of clinical trial. It starts out with, am I going to be a guinea pig? I mean, it really is kind of basic. And so it actually answers a lot of the questions. Now, in terms of community connections, I guess I'll let Dr. Patterson talk a little bit. Okay. We will or, get... Or Mrs. Pa yeah, or Sheila Patterson. I mean, I got reached out yeah. by the folks at Allen Temple, and I'm kind of um, available to do Zoom meetings and you know, answer questions. Yeah, so now we're going to hear from the coordinators. I think the first one is yeah. Dr. Deacon uh, Goodman. Yes. And, um, and then Sheila is going to come after. Yeah. Yeah, Deacon Goodman, you're on. Yes. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you uh, for everybody that I spoke to. Uh, in summary, we're looking at implementing uh, some health seminars and Zoom conferences and trying to get more people throughout the community uh, to take advantage of the clinical trials. 
uh, here in, in the Oakland area, we have a network of churches who collaborate on, on health initiatives. And I'm going to be reaching out to the pastor and uh, the health education members, many who are on this call today, so we can continue to support this effort. So I'm really excited about the possibilities. Uh, I talked to Janine and uh, Dr. Pinto about the myths that, that exist, and I think it's, it's very important uh, that we address those. And Dr. Pinto, you didn't mention this, but I know we have a, a time is of essence, but the fact that you mentioned that you actually went to Tuskegee and researched a lot of the things that happen, it may be something that we can talk about. Get rid of the myths. Thank you. Thank you, Deacon. Thank you. Thank you. And we will have Dr. Pinto speak about that in our Q and A period. Uh, Ms. Patterson, you're on. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am so excited. I just can't hide it. So I have <laughs> talked to all four of the speakers, and they are willing to work with us at Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship with our comprehensive cancer, our breast cancer. We've got a women's Bible study every Tuesday. I am an AKA, a 50-year golden, and if you saw the news Tuesday, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated uh, raised another $1 million for the HBCU colleges throughout the United States. And I am a graduate of Hampton University. All right. Uh, I am on the committee with my sorority, so I am going to make sure that you the things that you all are providing that I will make sure that our church, uh, um, our community, UT Southwest, we're already, we're already involved. 50 Hoops has been involved. Uh, Pat was telling me how pioneer speakers like uh, Dr. Green and Dr. Guter and all the others. So I'm part of that. I'm on the UT Southwest Community Advisory Board, and they are working on their National Cancer Institute vertical site right now. Uh, each one of you have already um, provided resources, screenings, a coffee hour, a Zoom presentation, answering questions. So I will make sure that gets out. It's, it's, and the Divine Nine. If you know the Divine Nine is our... Uh, nine uh, fraternities and sororities. I'm not on that committee, but of course I know them. So I am going to spread the word to let uh, them know what you all are doing all right. for those of us of color. Thank, Thank you. you so very much. Thank and you. as you know, you. like Jeannie and I talked for over an hour one time. So I'm going to be calling you, and please call me. You're, you're welcome at Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship on any second Sunday. The sorority, we're in Zoom now, like everything else, but I am on that health committee and have been for the last 37, eight years. So I will connect you with all those organizations. Jeannie, are you an AKA? Okay. Okay. <laughs> You That's do that. Will allow you in as well. I'm a fan. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm a big fan. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that's wonderful information. The next uh, coordinator is Miss Lachea Lester. Michelle. Yeah. Lachea Lester. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Oh, there you are. Okay. Yes. Hi. Yes. Okay. Hi. My name is Michelle Lester, and I am a part of. Uh, the healthcare ministry at College Park Baptist Church, which is located in Dallas, Texas, where our pastor is Reverend Carver Adams. I had an amazing brainstorming session with Jeannie, who's a part of Dr. Gobriel's lab, and we just came up with some amazing ideas. One of the things that we have been doing um, at our church is over the last five years, we've been having annual health fairs. Um, last year was the biggest one ever, where we had over 150 healthcare professionals on site from over 50 local agencies. All of the major hospitals participated, as well as students from the uh, medical schools, medical universities. Uh, our main focus is typically on um, healthcare awareness. However, we started also, um, that was our jump out for also uh, doing more for sexual health and education, as well as mental health advocacy. Um, one of the things um, that we were talking about when I was talking about with Jeannie is um, it, 
you know, just because we're in the middle of this crisis, I was looking for ways that we can use creative technology to replace these on-site um, health fairs that we were having. So some of the ideals include um, having um, not just uh, we're going to do social media campaigns and email marketing campaigns, but in addition, in addition to the videos that they're going to supply us, um, I thought it would be good for people in our community to see people in our community give somewhat of uh, elevator pitches regarding these studies. Mm. So uh, we have a man and a woman within our and within our church community who will be giving uh, who are we're going to record elevator pitches separately for. Um, to display that on our social media. We're also going to create a landing page on our website that's going to be dedicated specifically to this study. It's going to be a one place link that they go to that they will be able to be able to get and access all of the downloadable brochures, the flyers, the direct link to the study. And um, one of the things that I decided to do um, is that since I qualify for the study myself, utilize some of this new and emerging technology such as TikTok, and I just I decided to do a, um, a video journey of what that looks like. And I'm going to be recording that journey of what it looks like from signing up to the study to receiving my kid to going to get tested and waiting on the results. Uh, just to kind of make it a little bit more fun since we're doing something out of the box. So, I mean, a lot of great ideas. Again, we're going to use traditional methods, but we wanted to definitely do something uh, creative. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. You're next. Rick. Rick, Rick, you're on. <laughs> there I am. There you are. Okay, there you are. <laughs> yeah. well, I'm, I'm using the big screen, so that's what happens. Okay, okay. So, do it. <laughs> you know, had it talked to me. I first idea that I had was to uh, do something on Facebook. I do a lot of marketing on Facebook, so I thought I'd try this, and I came up with a little Facebook campaign that I was going to use and put it on different places uh, in the United States so we could target different neighborhoods that we wanted to target, or I could just use my personal uh, networking of people, friends and neighbors in, uh, I'm from Richmond, Virginia originally, so that'll be in Richmond, Virginia. So that was my idea. I, I created a, a quick little video and everything and I sent it over. So now I'm just waiting. Uh, Dr. Mugat did get back with me today and Dr. Gahan had gotten back with me. It's just a matter of picking a good time to uh, for me to start uh, marketing that video around. And, and if, if anybody wants to give me some areas to target that specifically you may know, I can I can target those areas. Can you show can you show that one minute video real quick? Yeah, you have to give me permission. Uh, oh, that's that's good. <laughs> Doris, can you do that? Uh, let's see. Yeah, yes. I see. I see it. I see it. I it's, see your desktop. Yeah. yeah, there it is. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rick Thornton, and I'm a prostate cancer survivor. Did you know that 90% of all men will get prostate cancer if they live long enough? The fact is, most men die of natural causes before they're diagnosed. Also, did you know prostate cancer is hereditary in many of its victims? This means that if someone in your family has had the disease, you're more susceptible to acquire it. African-American men are prime targets for this disease as it goes unchecked. We generally get fewer PSA screenings, therefore are more likely to be diagnosed with later stage cancer. In addition, we're less likely to have health insurance, therefore less likely to have the funds to combat its symptoms. So I'm asking all men of a certain age, that would be men 45 years and older, to join me on a 30 minute webinar to ask Dr. Jeffrey Gahan, a urologist at UT Southwestern who specializes in prostate cancer to answer all your questions about this disease. This is a public service affair, but it's sponsored by my company, Insurance for Dallas. So click the button below to sign up. There are limited spaces available. This could save your life or the life of a loved one. The time and dates are on the screen, so again, Click the button below to sign up and join the Zoom webinar hosted by my brother, Stefan. Yes! Hey. <laughs> that was wonderful. wonderful. Yes, and we did it. <laughs> now you can unshare your screen. Can you unshare it now? Yes. Can you still hear me? Yeah, we yes. can see your screen. Unshare we, your screen. We need to unshare your screen, but we can hear you. There, there you go. Thank you. So <laughs> wonderful.
great to have somebody know about technology. That's wonderful. <laughs> Our next presenter is uh, Miss Bradford, Virginia Bradford. Uh, where are you, Virginia? Virginia, I'm here. here. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I had to find the unmute button. <laughs> Good Thank afternoon. You. Thank you all for so much great information. Jeannie, and I know you want to share your screen too because you told us how lovely you look today. <laughs> I know, but I don't know how to get my picture up Just there. Just click that little video looking thing that has a line across it. Ah. So sure red, and you know. when you click that. I don't have a camera on this antique computer. <laughs> I'm sorry. However, Jeannie and I had a wonderful uh, discussion. I'm representing both uh, Kiana Black Nurses of Louisville. We're part of the National Black, Le uh, Na National Black Nurses Association and also Kentucky African Americans Against Cancer, which is KAC. And uh, hello, Dr. Britt and, and Ms. Cassandra Harris. We have been a part of the MBLIC coalitions for over 30 years. We started out with Midwest Region, working with Dr. Fumi and Dr. Terry Mason. So we've been a part of EPICS. We do a lot of community outreach and education for cancer with KAC. And one of the things that uh, we talked about doing for both of my organizations, uh, the Black nurses as well, we need to educate our healthcare providers, number one, so that they in turn are out in the community educating the community. And that's what our coalition also does with KAC. So we talked about doing a couple of workshops and with KAC, we also have mobilized and we have a large following um, of the faith and health ministries at the churches. And so those would also be the targets for us to go in, uh, well, for us to do it on Zoom or, utilizing social media as well and getting the information out. So Jeannie was very great in sending me the, um, the brochure, sending me some slides that, you know, just to give us the basic of what we're going to be dealing with. And so we are going to set up dates uh, in the next week. We're going to talk about dates where we can um, work with both of these organizations and getting the word out. When we talk about our community health education in Louisville, number one, we have a large group of nurse practitioners uh, who have recently opened up primary care offices, which is where we want to start with them. Um, with KAC and our volunteers, of course, we have a support group. We have the Faith and Action uh, churches that are members as well. So our reach is really going to be quite well, quite good. We also have a weekly radio show on WLLB, which is our African-American gospel radio station. Um, again, so that we can target talking about what we're gonna be showing uh, during the workshops or webinars or whatever we're calling them. But it, it's a great opportunity to reach as many people as we can. We also work with our council people, our local Metro Council, and they all make sure that they're also uh, putting that information in their newsletters. So we're looking forward to it. And I, I know that we'll have a lot of uh, participation as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Our final network coordinator is Dr. Angela Hill. I oh, think Dr. Austin, is she still here? Um, I have put her report in the chat. Dr. Angela Hill is in the chat. She has okay. a uh, sort of a, um, a very good report, actually. Uh, so it, it will be in the it's, chat. It's in the chat box. Yeah. Okay. Here it is. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yes, I see it. That's a wonderful one. So I think it's while we're waiting to get some Q&As, and we have only a few minutes. Um, we can run the polls, yeah. We're going to run the poll. And um, do we need to talk with the patient and information? We have uh, Cassandra, Issa Ray, okay. and North Texas Prostate Cancer Coalition. Yes. Uh, it'll be brief, and are I'll put we, in the links. Are you are you moving from no Q and A and just right to the last uh, patient information? Uh, why don't we get them so they can get done, and then we'll just do all the Q and A. Okay. 
Yeah. Sounds good. So Cassandra Harris, you're on. Okay, I'm back again. This has been great. Just wanted to share some information uh, about what I do at UD Anderson. I work in the Department of Health Disparities Research, and we bring researchers and communities together to impact health. And we also engage communities in our research efforts. And recently, we invited Pat and Ed to submit a letter of support for a U uh, University of North Texas grant called Texas Seal that is an NIH grant to uh, increase awareness about COVID research and the vaccine in African-American communities. Just found out yesterday that that a grant was awarded. Oh! Congratulations to everybody. Congratulations. We are working to uh, disseminate, create, disseminate and evaluate education messages around COVID-19 clinical trials and vaccines in African-American communities. So I'll be talking with Pat and a group about uh, getting input and feedback on the messages, how to create the messages, how to disseminate the messages in the days to come. We just found this out yesterday. Wonderful. SEAL, C-E-A-L, and the University of, of North Texas is the lead of this alliance, and there's different groups within uh, Houston, within Texas, I'm sorry, that are participating. And I understand that this opportunity has also been offered to other hotspot states. And so you may have some information in the states that you're in as well. So more to come on that. And um, just, to, just to share, I was on a, a webinar yesterday with Latinos and COVID, and one of the speakers said that her people had to call 911 because they didn't get the 411. So let's not let this happen to our community. We've got to get the information out so that we can be informed. Thank, Thank you, you so much. That was good. Okay, that's wonderful, and congratulations on getting that uh, grant opportunity. Issa Rae, Issa Rae? Issa Rae. Issa Rae. Issa Rae. Hi, everybody. Hi. Thanks for having us as part of your um, conference today. It's been an honor to be part of this group. Um, I'm Spencer, part of the brachytherapy team at Issa Rae, and I just, we always want to talk about how September is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. And it's so fitting that you know we're talking here today. And you know one of our biggest initiatives is always helping patients understand their treatment options. Uh, and that's one kind of really core to our philosophy. So in the last year, we've built out an entirely new patient um, portal. So you can go there, isarray.com slash together. And I think it's gonna be in the chat too. And perfect. And it's uh, easy to look on your phone. You can find other patient stories, support groups near you and online look for information on different treatment types and just learn all about, you know, those different, that journey that any uh, patient's going to go through. Um, so we're just thankful to be here and wanted to make sure you guys have that link and have some new resources to be able to look. Thank you. Steve. Thank you Thanks, so much. Now, um, there's a North Texas prostate group. Is that, um, um Dylan? Yeah. yeah our, Coalition consists of 50 hoops and five in-person support groups across the DFW area. Uh, with COVID, of course, we're not meeting in person, so we have collaborated to provide a monthly combined uh, support group Zoom session. And just coincidentally, our next session will be uh, on Monday, October 12th at 7 p.m. And the subject will be a presentation of which uh, prostate cancer trials are being conducted at Mary Crowley in Dallas. Uh, we have three primary communication methods. Our website is our primary one, uh, where we have educational information, the latest news on treatments, et cetera. Uh, and then we have two brochures that we use when we are permitted to go to health fairs, uh, church uh, events, men's health events, et cetera. And one of those, uh, we the two uh, brochures, one targets those who have already been diagnosed and provides information on area support groups. The second one is for those uh, concerned about prostate cancer, wanting to know what they should be doing uh, at their current age. And uh, so it's educational about prostate cancer and screening. And we also have that brochure provided in uh, Spanish for our Latino community. 
So that's what we're doing to get the word out. Uh, we are affiliated with us too, an international organization supporting uh, prostate cancer. And on our website, we have a list of support groups in the state of Texas. Us too has a list of all affiliated support groups for prostate cancer across the United States and elsewhere. That's it Thank for me. You. Thank you, Tom. We appreciate Thank it. Now you. we can move to a quick Q&A and then we'll do the gifts. Yes. Um, are there questions? Can you raise your hand either um, in the chat box or? I would like to say something first. I am okay. so proud of all of you. This is magnificent. I don't think anybody can top this. We're going to put this online so people can learn about solutions. You guys are champions and all of you. Thank you so very much. Okay, let mama, let mama sit back. Catch a breath. That's the important part of <laughs> working together. It's called collaboration. That's right. And that's when you can get things done. Up your tears. I am so happy. Okay, um, Robin, can you tell us if there are questions? Because I don't see any hands. Yep, there's a question here that came from Dr. Brett. I'm trying to go back and find it. He wanted to know about COVID and he wanted to, let's see if I can find his question. He had actually sent it to me. Okay. Um, so he had been um, curious what are the most pertinent barriers for getting Blacks in the COVID clinical trials? And what are your potential solutions? for getting, getting um, African-Americans into COVID clinical trials? Well, that's a very, that's very important question and very timely. I will just say working with the National Medical Association and how very important it is to get us engaged in the clinical trials, particularly in COVID. But hearing Cassandra talk about what they're doing with their grant at uh, uh, the University of North Texas, uh, Morehouse School of Medicine, uh, and the, the uh, I'm US forgetting the correct Health. name of their institute that's working on a COVID program. I think two very important pieces that we all need to remember. You have to have an agent of trust. It's very key that the organization, a group that's coming into your community must talk about trust. And, and there are people on the call that don't know about um, Tuskegee. And so we're going to have Dr. Pinto to speak some words about that. But we have passed beyond that. That's we right. need data that's specific for us. And if we are not in those trials, we do not get it. COVID, the highest number of people that are dying from it, and it's not just old people, it's all people that are dying, happens to be people of color. That's right. And so it's important for us to be a part of the studies. Right now, COVID is a disease that we are learning about as we go along. There are new things all the time. It's a viral illness. So the specific treatment but COVID is not there. And so we're trying to come up with the vaccine. Even though it seems like we're rushing to get this vaccine and we need to have people in the studies, but if you're going to participate in the study, make sure you research it carefully to know who's putting it on and that all of your questions are answered. It's engaging people that you trust so that we can get the data that's going to be important for us. I will let Dr. Pinto speak a little bit because we had a question and related to that about Tuskegee and the program that's there. Um, we've moved beyond that and there are a number of key protective um, uh, entities that are there from governmental, uh, FDA, NIH, CDC, um, various, uh, laws that have been enacted to protect us from the kinds of atrocities that happened in the past with COVID, with uh, Tuskegee and some of the earlier studies. Can I, can, I, can I get a question in so sure. that whoever's going to respond, I think you mentioned the name. You see, yes. what, uh, my concern is that we tell the whole truth. Yes. So when we mention Tuskegee, 
the average person in our community, they see Tuskegee, I think the average person should be made aware that the study was done at Tuskegee, but the study was sanctioned by the U.S. Public Health Care Service. And so uh, if, we, if we go back in time, I think there was some, some, uh, some moves to get the president, I think it was Clinton at the time, to apologize for that. We have to tell the whole story if we're going to get our people to be supportive of this. You see, failure to acknowledge what's really going on limits your ability to move forward in the progressive manner that you want to do so. So when we talk to Tuskegee, let's put the U.S. Public Health Sur Care Service did this at Tuskegee. We got to tell the whole story. Otherwise, people will continue to say, no, I'm not going to do it. That's, okay. that's, that's my statement question. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Gritt. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I had mentioned that uh, years ago, uh, many of us clinical investigators, and I am a cancer clinical investigator, that's what I do in my career. Yes, I take care of patients, but I run clinical trials programs um, in conjunction with the National Cancer Institute. And many of us uh, were actually brought to Tuskegee, went to Tuskegee to actually uh, learn firsthand a little bit about what happened there. And, um, and a lot of the focus, and rightly so, is on the individual participants who participated in the study and the neglect that was um, given them as part of that study, as well as the harms that came from that neglect. Um, and the entire study was founded on, you know, a kind of racist premise about biology. So there's a lot that's there. However, when I went to Tuskegee, what I realized in going there was it was a public health catastrophe. Not just the US Public Health Service, but actually these participants were untreated. And what a lot of people do not realize is that there was an epidemic of this infectious disease related to these untreated patients in yeah. that very small community for a long time. And so the tragedy is not just for the participants, but for the entire community. And so the outrage is actually generalized and represents a public health failure. Now we are in a time where we are living through another public health failure. And we have to understand that sometimes these public health failures are not coincidental. And we really need to work very hard to address the public health and to support our public health professionals who are trying to do the right thing. But um, I, I'll just say that, and you can hear the passion in my voice, because after going there, I left with a bigger, huger outrage because of the public health failure, okay? And let, let, I, let me, I would just me. say that, okay? Let me get back in. You just said something about the, the public health failure that we have right now is not unintentional. Okay. We don't want to get off on the wrong track. We're trying to finish up the solutions. Uh, Dr. Just, Red, I'm sorry. He, understood. he said that. I just have to, I just yeah. need to follow up. Yeah. I, yeah, I get it. I, well, get it. I, I think to level this, to say that it's unintentional, we all know that had the U.S. acted faster, perhaps 200,000 plus lives may not have been lost. Yeah. We have to recognize that in this country, there are various, um, well, just to put it bluntly, racism is alive and well in the United States. Yeah. Bottom line. We now, don't I have want, to finish. The reasons for the public health failure, um, there could be a lot of different reasons. I'm yes. not, you know, I'm not saying anything about what those reasons are now, but I'm just trying to point out that we really do need to support science in the yes, public Yes, we health do. And, and I agree uh, with that. Actually support yes. our public health professionals as much as possible. I have um, one thing to say about what Dr. Britt said, what Dr. Pinto said, and Dr. Brown has said. We have been around for 23 years and we have taken surveys and you would be surprised how Tuskegee 
resonates with the 50 plus crowd, but those in the younger crowd, that is not as significant regarding they're not participating in trials. Every black person doesn't say Tuskegee. We're the ones that say Tuskegee because we remember it, we're closer to it. I am not discounting any of what you say, but we're talking solutions. And I think what we have found is that the biggest problem in African-Americans in participating in trials is the lack of knowledge about the trial, about the education. Now that didn't happen in Tuskegee and technically it's not really, ha there's such a confusing message now, it's not the educate, but this is what we're here for. We're here to look at solutions and I agree with you. I am black person, been black all my life and I have heard about Tuskegee since a child. But this has not played the role, the major role, in all of the African Americans not participating in trials. It is educating and doing the things that Sheila has said, doing the things that Tom has said, doing the things Cassandra has said, what every Danita has said, what everybody has said they are about to do. They are changing the pattern of how we think. This event today is changing the pattern of how people think about clinical trials. And I cannot wait to, but now we had about 50 people. I can't wait to post this online. And I hope each of you, I'm a preacher's kid. I hope each of you will post the link to this video and we become educated about clinical trials and understand that when we walk in a crowd of black folks, we don't even need to bring in Tuskegee because we're just taking a step back. We need to talk about what they need to know right now. Solutions. Solutions. And I should say, just to finish that, and I saw uh, two hands, um, the National Medical Association for over 20 years have had a project <laughs> called Project impact, increasing minority participation in clinical trials. And it's about awareness right. and education. And of course, it also means that we have to serve as the principal investigators of some studies. We have to be right. engaged at all levels. And so it's very important that we participate and we are participating in the studies on COVID. The NMA has developed a task force that's going to put out guidelines because I know that the public is generally confused because we are getting some government organizations that are putting out one message one day and changing it on the next day and we're a little confused so we're trying to get together information that is specific for people of color that will guide us. Yeah. The final you, statement you that I'm going to make on that yeah, and then I'll give it to you, Ed, is that things have changed over the past 50, 60 years, and there are laws that will protect people participating in clinical studies. Thank you. Know that you cannot do things that are unethical. Thank you. And get away with it. So to know and to say, you need to be aware. And the final piece Many of our patients don't get to participate in clinical trials because their healthcare provider do not tell them about it. So we have to educate our healthcare providers as well as the community about what is there, what it means, who's so eligible, so who's not it. eligible. So all of that. I'm not a preacher's kid, so I won't preach and I'll but give you it to you. sound like Ed. one. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to stop now. Mm -hmm. We're going to do the prizes because... This can go on till six o'clock tonight. Yeah, we gotta go. We oh want... no! Well, I got a nine-year-old who's homeschooling. Can we do this? It's okay. Okay. There were there were just two questions, Cassandra okay. Harris and Dr. Sneed, and then uh, put up another poll while the questions. Yeah, being go asked. ahead and put the poll up, Robin. The poll's done. <laughs> the poll's <laughs> done. Right. We're good. We're good. Okay, go we ahead. do have a couple other questions. One from Beverly White. Okay. Um, she was saying, I appreciate I appreciate that question. The trust factor is key. Um, I am a small business certified. I'm a small business owner certified with the National Minority Supplier Development Council. Over 700 African American businesses who employ multicultural teams. 
would it be the value for 50 Hoops to connect with the president of National, um, Me uh, National Minority Supplier Development Council on starting a dialogue for information sharing, possibly expanding a positive narrative? 50 Hoops? Yes. Okay, that's good. Okay, so then um, let's see. Somebody else said, do we need, so uh, Tanya said, so we do need to have more minorities in health care and working on trials. I don't know what would help with that trust building because I asked that this question, yet I've seen um, the people speaking to someone of their own race, but they were lying to them about the trial. So Tanya uh, just sort of wanted to know what to do. Seek out another source. Tanya Mitchell wanted to know, yeah. Uh, Contact sure. Pat. <laughs> yeah, we have all the links. We have all those links up. Uh, Wilma yeah. Roundtree, thank you so much for allowing the people just to go ahead and download, to upload these uh, questions. Let's get moving. We got to give away some money and some prize. Okay, Let's do it. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Porter is not with us, so I get to find some you names. Do and it. Out. <laughs> <laughs> and just want to remind everyone the links are in the chat. If you want the links to Bristol Myers Squabs, they're in the chat. I'm going to link to the Moffitt Cancer Center, that the, the retreats in the chat. So lots of links. Keep looking at the chat. <laughs> okay. okay. Maya Davis is going to win a prize. Ed, what am I giving away? We've got 10 gift bags to start out with. Okay. Uh, Maya again? gets a gift bag. Say that put again. Put your uh, email address in the chat box, Maya. I'll okay. put the email. Go ahead. Yes. And I'm trying to move the screen because there's so many people on the list. Okay, Lorraine Eddings. Okay. Um, Michelle Roundtree. She's alternating, sweetheart. Oh, yes, I'm alternating. So I'm just calling names. You will tell them what they're getting. Uh, Aileen Warren. Gift bag. Okay, Zolene Bruna. Gift card. Farouk Awan. Uh oh. F A R U K. F A R R U K H. Gift bag. Come on. Thank uh, you, Lady, Lady Marie Hammond. Gift card. Beverly White. Gift bag. I lost my screen here just a minute. Okay. Let me get back. Uh, Go all the way to all the screens and pick people. From oh, yeah, there. that's what I'm going all the way. Of. Catherine, okay. Catherine, I don't know, Marine, I don't see the Ma Marinette. Hi, Catherine. Yeah. Okay. All Gift right. Gift card. Gift card. Dashana, and it says ST. I don't know what the last name Dashana. Gift bag. Okay. Terry Wilson Gray. Gift card. Hey, baby. <laughs> okay. Um, I just had Regina Lowy. Oh. Gift bag. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Did I call Tanya Mitchell? No. Gift okay. card. All we right. Got let's... three more bags. Okay. Nubia Esmeralda. All right. Gift bag. And uh, I'm not going that way. I guess I'm. Uh, Nader Shayla. <laughs> say that Did again. I spell to say that last name correctly? Say that again. Nader. Nader Shaya. Where's Nader? Nader, show yourself. Spell yeah. it. Spell How do I pronounce your last name? Nader Shaya. Oh, yeah. Here it is right here. Yeah, good. <laughs> okay. Right, one, more, one more gift bag. Danita Brown. Okay, that's it. Okay. Let's, let's pray and go home, guys. Yes. Have a single ton. You're on. We're gonna have the we're gonna have the benediction by Pastor Lester Singleton, a senior pastor at St. Matthew's Baptist Church, Fort Worth, Texas. Amen. Let us bow our heads for a moment and thank God for this conference. Lord, as we dismiss uh, from this conference, we in no means, Lord, dismiss from your holy presence. We pray that you will continue to watch over us, lead us, guide us, and protect us, and bless us as we go forth to our respective destination. 
Continue to let your light shine upon us, and we give you all praises right now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless all amen. of you, and thank you so very much. And tomorrow, Pat, you.